Okay, this is the antecedent intervention part of our RBT training. Um, another word for antecedent intervention is proactive strategies. So these are things that you really, 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 really want to take advantage of <laughs> because why wait till you're seeing all kinds of crazy behavior before you break it out. Okay, so typically there's three types of intervention procedures, antecedent interventions, or things you do before the behavior ever happens to make it less likely, um, teaching replacement behaviors, and consequence interventions. So consequences are usually what we use is extinction because when we're talking about from the perspective of a problem behavior, because we see the problem behavior once it's happening, we don't, all we can really do is extinguish it. We can't reinforce it for future. We can try to like redirect it and deescalate it. But as far as that behavior is concerned, we want to extinguish it. Replacement behaviors are kind of like a, like a middle ground because we're using reinforcement for an alternative behavior that's a good behavior. And then we're using extinction for the target behavior. So that's kind of like both. Like it is, it's, it's proactive in the sense that we're teaching an appropriate skill that they'll be more likely to use in the problem behavior, so maybe the problem behavior won't ever happen, but it's reactive in the sense that we won't teach the appropriate replacement unless we also extinguish the inappropriate behavior. Um, so all three are actually, like the best behavior plans will use all three and the best interaction with your client will use all three of these. Um, so antecedent interventions, the following training is going to focus on antecedent interventions. Um, so let's take a little moment to review this. Hopefully you remember this from the section on acquisition programming and how to run discrete trials. Um, so what's an antecedent and our basic <coughs> overview of behavior? Antecedents are events that occur immediately before a behavior occurs. So for example, a traffic light might turn red and then you press the brake and then the car stops. So what's the ABC of that? Traffic mm -hmm. lights and the scene. Your behavior is pushing the brake, mm -hmm. and the um, consequence is the car stops. Yes. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's this is you guys just said this. Um, light turns red is the antecedent. We're, that's what we're talking about, and then the rest of the ABC is press the brake and the car stops. Antecedent behavior consequence. Um, so antecedent interventions, behaviors that produce reinforcement are likely to happen again in the future. Um, things or events that immediately precede a behavior that produces reinforcement can get, become associated with those behaviors. This is stimulus control, if you remember this from the, um, the acquisition section. Um, sometimes antecedents can gain what is known as stimulus control over a behavior. So if you remember the definition, the more official and um, in-depth definition for stimulus control is when a behavior happens more often in the presence of the SD than in its, in its absence. So if we look at that same stoplight example, um, if you're driving down the road, how often does your behavior, does stopping happen in the presence of a stoplight? Always. All the time. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. <coughs> I was running yesterday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then how much how often does the behavior of stopping happen in the absence of a stoplight hardly, hardly ever or unless there's some other condition that makes right. that happen same thing with well, let's see if there's more. Um, so these interventions focus on what is occurring before the behavior so once those events um, control someone's behavior like you know if you have a kid who has really good instructional control and you can say stop then you can use that to control their behavior. Um, so antecedent interventions focus on making changes to the environment or events that occur before the behavior happens. Um, by changing what happens before behavior, we can reduce the likelihood of the behavior occurring. So this, like I said, is a proactive approach. Um, in, when you read your behavior support plan, there's gonna be a part that says proactive strategies and reactive strategies. The proactive strategies are all antecedent interventions. Um, they can involve reducing the motivation to engage in a target behavior um, or other ways to make the behavior less likely, like make it impossible or make it difficult. Um, and then so when the behavior doesn't occur, it can't get reinforcement. And then we improve our chance to be able to teach other skills and have them do other things that we want to get reinforcement. 
Um, so when we talked about stimulus control, we're talking about SDs, um, which the real word for that is discriminative stimuli. Um, these are stimuli that are associated with reinforcement. Like I said before, the definition of stimulus control was when a behavior happens more in the presence of this stimulus than in its absence. So if I'm trying to teach my dog to like stand up, I want it to stand up when I say stand up, not like just all the time. And a lot of times you'll see this with like training you want it to be in response to that command. So reinforcement is there for the dog when you say stand up. And sometimes when you're trying to teach an animal a trick, like it starts just doing it. And sometimes people, they give the reinforcement so they're not creating that discriminative stimuli. They're just reinforcing the behavior at any time. If a person does it right and they're teaching it, they finally like, oh, this dog's doing it. They stand up, I give a treat. Stand up, give a treat. Stand up, give a treat. And then when they say the, be the dog is hungry and it comes around and it's like, hey, are you gonna give me a treat? If they're doing it the right way, they won't treat because they didn't say stand up. So that's how stand up becomes an SD. Um, and it's this process. As if the SD is clap, you see clapping and then you get praise. And then the, uh, the, the other side of the coin is if the kid just comes up to you and claps, then like you're not gonna praise that because you're trying to teach, do that when I say clap. Um, so SDs are everywhere and SDs have a lot to do with our kids and their behavior, uh, sometimes more than we realize. So like if the phone rings, we answer. Um, someone says hi and we say hi back to them. The oven ding, like, hi is an SD for like, hi. Um, the oven dings and then you check on the food. So if you're cooking food and the oven dings, how often do you do that behavior? How often do you check food when the oven dings? Every time. Every time. How often do you check the food when the oven didn't ding? Every now and then. Sometimes you might be like, oh, I'm gonna check on it. <laughs> like me every Unless it's smoking. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> but every 30 minutes is different. I mean, technically if you're cooking food for an hour, and you check on it three times in the absence, like every minute you didn't check, you could have been, you're not constantly checking. You're waiting for that thing. So an SD tells us that reinforcement is available for us to engage in a behavior. The ding tells us that the food will be edible. Um, so stimulus control, we've been talking more about like isolated signals, like instructions and kind of signals from the environment, but other things can have control over our behavior. For example, people, um, settings, and objects. So certain people, places, or things can gain stimulus control over behaviors due to a history of reinforcement. Um, for example, a child hugs their parents, but not others because their parents have reinforced this behavior. Um, with, with little children, it's kind of different, but say you start to become like an adolescent or adult, and you say like, hey, and you hug somebody you know, they're gonna say like, hey, and hug you back. If you say, hey, and hug somebody you know to a stranger, they're gonna be like, ah. So stranger gets no reinforcement, friend gets reinforcement, the friend becomes an SD for hug me. And then another situation would be like, if they don't hug their parents in front of their social group because the social group punishes that behavior. So say, even if it's hug parents or like, yeah, you drop a kid off to school, and so like at home, home is one setting, school is another setting. This is when it talks about settings <laughs> can control. So at home, a kid is happy to hug their parents and say like, mommy, I love you. Then you take the kid to drop off to school and the setting is in front of friends at school. And it's like, bye mom, I love you. You're embarrassing me. Like, yeah, you all like a big kissy face in front of all your friends. Um, so setting events can also act, uh, affect behavior. Setting events can increase the likelihood that a behavior will occur. Um, like, so for example, if a kid comes here and we don't reinforce their behavior, all of MDS starts to control their behavior and it, we, we're the signal that like that inappropriate behavior does not get reinforced. Maybe they're at school and their teachers do reinforce it. So school becomes a signal for like act this way and you start to see like lots of inappropriate behavior at school and none at meaningful day. Or sometimes it's the other way around, you never know. But the setting can, um, can change things. 
Um, so, for example, oversleeping in a, is a setting event that, and also it can be things that uh, happen before, like you, you, you know, your kid might be tired, hungry, might have just gotten bad news, might have um, not gotten to do something that they wanted to do really bad. Maybe there was a change that interrupted their schedule, like they always take the bus to school and this is a kid who's very schedule oriented and they didn't go on the bus and now their whole day is flipped upside down. Um, so antecedent interventions make modifications to the environment to decrease the need to use target behaviors. That's another way that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, so by identifying common setting events, NSDs, we can modify our interventions and decrease target behaviors. Um, so no, basically this comes about, the best way to go about it is knowing your learner. There's no real way around it. Obviously you're not going to, you're going to have a first session with every kid. We have a lot of staff and we flip around, so you're going to have a second and a third session with every kid. But you want to be using that time to like, you want to talk to the other therapist and you want to um, give yourself the best chance. Eventually you will get to know a kid and you can start to recognize these things. You can start to recognize like different behavior, um, unusual behavior and like, oh, maybe he's tired and use that to inform your session. So here's some examples of things we can do proactively before we ever see inappropriate behavior, inappropriate behavior less likely. Um, so let's say you have a kid and you know that a tendency for this kid is to be non-compliant with self-help skills. Um, and you're in the trailblazer building and you wanna do like, okay, it's time we have to do toothbrushing, brushing hair and making the bed. Um, you can maybe provide a choice so that maybe the, the SD make your bed has become aversive because in the presence of the SD make your bed they go Bleh! and they get out of making their bed so instead of presenting that SD you say hmm should we fluff the pillow first or should we take off the sheet maybe that's not the best example because sometimes there's an order for things like that <laughs> but just right. gen for things you can provide a choice with you want to provide a choice or you maybe say like do you want to um do the bed first or brushing teeth first for some kids this might not be effective they might be like neither i hate it but for some kids just yeah. that change in it's not that they yeah. hate the activity so much it's that the whole si like every time someone's approached them with a work task it's yeah. not something they want. So if they approach it, like, maybe you get a choice of doing this. And then they're like, oh, okay. Because choices are an SD that's associated with reinforcement. When people offer you choices, that's usually a good thing. When people tell you things, yeah, that's a that's not usually an indicator that you're not going to get reinforcement. Like one of our clients who used to say, uh, try again, it would set him off every single mm -hmm. time. Because he heard, because he did ABO, ABA for so long as a kid, that every, that's all he heard was try mm -hmm. again, so you'd have to say something different. If you said something different, it was fine. It's fine. And I've seen that with no, like, kid respond to, right. like, no. Or if you, and you change it to try again. Right, and they're like, oh, And then okay. they're cool, right. yeah. yeah. Because in that situation, try again has the become person. an SD, or has, it's just a person. It signals yeah. you're not getting reinforcement. Right. Or even a kid now that instead of calling it a word, called do 10 trials yeah right <laughs> i've heard that yeah and it it works it's fine right yeah. it's like a pairing issue uh, that right whatever it is like if you say if a kid in in their history every time they've been given a worksheet it means they have to sit for 20 minutes it's not that they don't like working or don't know how to do that worksheet or don't you know don't want to show you their skills it's like when they see worksheet that means 20 minutes of punishment right so maybe take it and say like let's color on this worksheet yeah, or let's, like let's do this let, yeah let's do this yeah like bring it to the you want to break up that association with the aversive task um so if you have a kid who has disruptive classroom behavior um you might want to move the kid's desk closer to the teacher because the teacher should be an sd for appropriate behavior like if the teacher sees him behaving appropriately she's going to praise it and if the teacher sees him behaving inappropriately, she's going to, you know, do something else. And so if he's close to the teacher, then maybe he'll change his behavior. Um, so an infant learning to crawl puts their fingers in an electrical outlet um, and you want to use covers. This is, in one sense, it's just blocking it, which is what we were talking about before, where like if we can make that behavior just not happen at all, 
then it won't get reinforcement because if the kid touches the outlet and feels that little groove and it's like, okay, this is a little, there's texture to it, there's something, it'll get reinforced. If they touch the cover and nothing, it won't get reinforced and, or maybe they do it for attention. Maybe it's not an infant. Maybe it's a kid who knows that like, oh, if I scream, my, you know, my therapist can handle screaming. If I hit them, they can handle hitting. If I put my finger in the outlet, they're going to be right there and attend to it. So kids will tend to do that. So they'll tend to find like, what's the most dangerous thing? I, they'll find the one thing you cannot wow. ignore. So if you put that cover on it, now you can ignore it. So you can, the, the outlet is not an SD for like, this is something that I can get attention with. Um, so stimulus scroll, the most important SD is you. You should be, people, like we talked about how, maybe if you have a situation where, we talked about the settings where um, at MDS is a setting that is an SD for appropriate behavior and school is an SD for inappropriate behavior. Same thing, you might have two teachers um, where the teacher in the afternoon reinforces inappropriate behavior and the teacher in the morning does not. So you see a change in behavior where you see more problematic behavior with the um, second teacher later. Um, the same thing here, you want to tell your key, like when your kid sees you, they should be like running to the chair and saying like, oh, that's the person that, you know, does all these fun things with me. I might have to do a little bit of work for it, but the work is like a reasonable amount that's worth the training. Like Cooper mentioned yesterday, like we'll wait three hours in line for a roller coaster, but we wouldn't wait three hours for Coke. So if you're providing lots of reinforcement, even though reinforcement is a consequence, um, when you provide it for good behavior, you're still being proactive about making the problematic less behavior less likely. Um, so you want to signal reinforcement is available for good behavior. This is called instructional control. This is like one half of instructional control means that you signal when you do good things, good things will happen. And when your kid has a, a long enough history with you that they, that that starts to affect their behavior. <coughs> Um, the other half, half of it is if you engage in problematic behavior, it's not going to work with me. Um, so the important thing here is we already did like an extensive training on this, which is going to be out of order, but technically we did, um, about, you know, initial pairing with your client, um, but don't kind of, this is something that people kind of tend to overlook and say like, you get so focused on, I have to get my kid to work, we have to master these programs, we have to get through these programs. When you pair, you're making this huge investment in that work and how quickly that progress will happen and how effective your teaching will be. So take it seriously during your first couple sessions and if you ever realize like, uh-oh, I've become aversive, you know, my kid is, my kid sees me and is like, starts to engage in problem behavior, then you need to maybe take it back and work with your behavior and saying like, hey, how can I undo this? Like the thing we talked about with the worksheets, you know, work, just the sight of a worksheet becomes like, I don't want to do that. And that can happen with a therapist because we're here to work, like we're here to help a kid learn. We're not here to fart around all day. So sometimes I think people think of that initial pairing process as like, we're not doing anything, we're not getting anything done, but if you do it right and you take it from some quick pairing to like very slowly introducing demands, then you're gonna become really, 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 really effective with your learner. Um, and then the other thing is we wanna use motivation to our advantage. Um, so just some general tips for using motivation. Um, keeping energy high, this is, it has a little asterisk because that's a generally good piece of advice, but for some kids, it might not be effective because maybe they don't like loud noise, maybe they don't, um, you know, they might have sensory issues, or some kids, we have one kid who when, you, when you're high energy with him, he has a lot of high energy right back <laughs> with everybody else. <laughs> and just, and, and it's, it's hard for him to calm down. Um, you want to mix in mastered and easy activities and provide reinforcement for those. So sometimes you're working with a kid, the things we're working on with them are actually really hard for them. Um, so if you 
are on a program that's like a non-preferred program, really difficult skill for them. Maybe it's like vocal imitation when they're they're trying, but it's not doing it. And you're saying like, no, 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 no. Like, what do you think is gonna happen? They're gonna become upset. So you can do things like, instead of just doing 10 straight trials, like do a couple of difficult trials and then mix in some, like throw in things they do know, throw in like a clap, so, and then you give moderate reinforcement for those things so that the sitting is not like awful for them and awful for you. Because therapists don't like to say no, no, no either. That becomes discouraging for you. And then you wanna like, let's just get through this program. And then that's where you see on the program sheet is like this big hole because therapists avoid it because they feel like they're not making progress with the kid. It's not like they're doing it on purpose. Like, oh, I'm not gonna do my job and do this program. It's like just a natural reaction. Um, you can present things in a first then format. This is like a really, really good kind of little tip. Um, and we do this when we say like, hey, what do you want to work for? Let's, you know, let's, let's count down to it, pro provide a pre-task choice. Um, and then, and then that motivation is there. You don't have to actually provide reinforcement. It's just, they know that reinforcement is coming. So for example, if you have a kid who does not like to go to the bathroom, like they, 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 that's aversive for them for whatever reason. Um, you might, and then they do have a really powerful reinforcer. So you get a paper and you say like, hey, instead of saying like, let's go to the bathroom and then immediately engaging target behavior, you can say like, hey, I'll make you a deal. If you go to the bathroom, you can have this. And then that way you presented it in a way that you don't have to follow through with the task. You can just follow through with your little contract. So if you say like, do you want to play toys? Okay. If you, or say trains, kid loves trains. If you go to the bathroom, we'll do trains. Do you want to go to the bathroom? And then now it's a, it's a, it's a question and a choice and a reinforcer. And then if they say no, you can say, okay, cool. And you didn't present it in a demand format, so it's like, okay, and then now, note to self, like, okay, I need something other than trains. The only thing, this is a little trick, you never, ever, 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 ever want to introduce this after you're already seeing problem behavior, because this is that, like, so say you have a kid who's having a meltdown, you say, let's go to the bathroom, they scream, kick, cry on the floor. First bathroom, then trains. If you do it that way, now you're just reinforcing that behavior because it's like if I do this I'll get an op they'll beg me to do it correctly and I'll get something for it so that's like the big little like uh but wait about that but if you do it correctly like you say like hey you work so nicely I'm gonna make you an offer how about I'll play trains with you this activity that you love if you go to the bathroom and you can even make it like just step into the bathroom depending on how aversive it is for the kid um providing choices for some kids this is like crazy effective it's uh, it's almost like hard to explain but like you were talking about it before with Mr. W how it's like things that are things that yesterday cause you know that he's like no I don't want to it's like throw a fun little activity in there and then provide a choice and they change it um, this is a big one and then this we'll get into this later when we get into natural environment but you can if your impression is, I have to pull my kid to the table, pull out the binder, we're on this program, I'm gonna finish this program, I'm gonna do 10 trials of it, and then we're gonna you know, move on to the next program or move on to the next activity, that's, that's not true. That's a myth, that's not how it is. If you want to, um, if you have a, a task that's kind of like difficult for a kid, like say you can take the program, say it's, um, Say it's vocal imitation, like something really hard for a kid and the kid loves trampoline, you can go to the trampoline, get them in there, hold their hands, and then be like, bounce, 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 say ooh, rocket bounce, because you got to bounce so high. Bounce, 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 say ah, oh. boom, bounce, 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 say e, and then they don't do it, and then you go like, okay, let's bounce a small bounce, you know, you can kind of work it in, or you can do, like what we were talking about yesterday is like catch with like, whatever the task is, like it's maybe say like, do this and then they have, to, and then throw the ball and they have to do it before you throw the ball. So you can work on, you know, you can make it, you can make these programs fun. You do not have to just sit at the table and run trial after trial after trial. Um, and then another thing that will 
have a huge impact on your session is to use surprise reinforcement. So if you're saying like, okay, in five, four, three, two, one, we're gonna work, we're gonna get this, that's not very motivating. It gets motivating when you're at two and one, but at five, it's really not very motivating. Um, so every once in a while, you wanna say, when you see either appropriate or exceptional behavior, you wanna say like, Psh, I'm taking off all your numbers and we're gonna go. And this can have like, you don't really don't have to do it very often for it to have a really big impact because then that early, those few early stages are motivating and you'll be much more likely to see your kid push through to the five the majority of time that you're using it than when you are just like, okay, five, four, three, two, one, because that's almost like somebody coming and say, putting like a pile of work on your desk and saying like, here, get started on this work. Like m most people's response to that is not like, okay, <laughs> and like getting to work. If somebody says like, here, here's all this work you need to do, you kind of like, let me go get a coffee. <laughs> let me go like okay I'm gonna and you kind of procrastinate a little bit and that's the like that's our version of inappropriate behavior when a client's version of that is like Wah. so like but imagine if your boss came and said like here finish this and he said okay I'll get to write to work on it and you open the first folder and it says like surprise for, you know I want to reward you for your gumption and now you don't this pile doesn't even they're all empty like you would do that more often and you'd be like, okay, I'll do it. You'd be like, boom, 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 boom. And that's how you start to see that like really persistent, good, helpful responding. Um, so just to clarify, motivation is not actual reinforcement, but it is related. Um, like when you're doing the first then, you're, you haven't reinforced anything yet. When you say like first bathroom, then trains, you didn't reinforce the bathroom because they haven't gone to the bathroom and then given that consequence. But when you can communicate, it's there then it's more motivating. And you can either do that, some kids can understand this, some kids can read, some kids can listen to language, um, some kids can't, so you have to do that with your history with them. When you do your reinforcement, right, the SD, like going Becomes, to the next SD can be the reinforcer. Yeah, and that's how it should be. Like if, a lot of times the S SD is a, is a punisher because, or it's like an aversive thing to hear because it means like, oh, now you have to work. But, you know, when tasks are reasonable and reinforcement is big, like you want that offer to, like it's almost like, yeah, it's almost like your boss coming and giving you, like you want to get a promotion because you want them to say like, hey, will you take on this additional responsibility and I'll give you more money. Like that's what the SD should be. It should be like, hey, if you do this, can you get this? Like, yes, of course I will. Um, so decreasing motiva motivation to engage in problem, that was motivation for learning and good behavior. Um, we can also use this to our advantage to um, decrease motiva motivation to engage in problem behavior. So if you remember all the functions, um, there was tangible, attention, escape, and automatic. Um, so clients engage in problem behavior because it accesses these functions. If we provide these things freely, then you can remove the need to engage in problem behavior. Um, so, for for the first one, attention. So, what does this look like when you provide attention freely? Well, you mean to like, no. like for not showing them the attention? For so, like, a kid engages <laughs> in dis like moderately disruptive behavior, like kind of disruptive behavior to get attention. So what would an antecedent thing you could be that you could do so that they're already getting your attention, you don't need, they don't need to do that. You need to remove the cup before they even like start to pick it up to like play. If you know that they like fidget with things and that's and gonna, then you can just yes, remove it. That, and I should have probably put that in the earlier ones. Just general, in general, if you're having issues while you're at the table with like, I'm gonna roll away in this rolly chair. I'm gonna get up and run. I'm gonna like tear the stimuli. I'm gonna throw things, like remove those things early. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. people will suffer, suffer, suffer through it and then be like, and then finally be like, no. So the faster you can recognize those things, like maybe if you're working on like putting objects in a bucket and you put 20 objects in front of the kid and then they go like, psh, uh, yeah. throw all the objects. Put one object. Put one object at a time, things like that. Hold but, on to the bucket mm -hmm. so then 
yes, things like that. Um, just preventing their ability to do it. What about, um, so like, you, what about decreasing, what about making them not even want your attention in the first place? Like the, the, like the rationale is they want your attention <clears throat> instead of having, them, having them. You just give them your attention when you they're just sitting. Freely, yeah. Like, no content, like, like yes. Like, when they like a constant stream. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or a constant, yeah. Yeah. Constant or frequent. Mm -hmm. um, so what would that look like? It, uh, I should have done this first. So I think we'll do a little role play and practice it, and I will be a kid who engage it, I'm engaging in behavior for attention, um, and we'll play trains or farm. Maybe with Cooper since he lost trains yeah. farm. <laughs> Cooper. You're not coming to sit over there. Um, yeah. I'll move, yeah. I'll move. <laughs> Your free spirit, I guess. <laughs> I, was so I feel like I, I came in on the weekend. So pretend I messed up. I was supposed to do this as like a baseline before we talked about this. Oh, we'll edit it. And just say like, okay, okay play. <laughs> so am I the client or are you the client? I'm the client. Okay. And you are just. Am I probing or am I just like. No, this is like free time. Okay. You're just trying to. Get your engaged. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you're trying to. Teaching you like how to. Proactively play. provide attention so that. I don't have to do crazy things to get your behavior. Satisfied. Yeah, just go. Okay. Hi, watch. Here we go. Look, see the train? Woo! Good. So you take the train, look, it rolls over the bridge. Choo choo! Choo choo! Choo choo! Choo choo! choo. You try it. Push it through. Choo choo! Good job, push. Good job! Choo -choo. Excellent. Try it again. Try it again. Here you go. Push it through. Choo -choo. Good try. Here, let's try to push it through the bridge. Good try. Look, ready? Boo! Choo choo! Good job! Excellent! Good! Here you go. Try it again. Push it through. Do it! Yeah! Whoa! High five! Good job! High five. Boom! Excellent! There you go. Yes. That was good. And actually, it did work out because you did do what I wanted you to do. So, well, who can? <laughs> so that was a lot of attention, but it was also a lot of demands. Mm -hmm. So that's like what gets really hard with our kids because we're used to working with them. And sometimes our kids are nonverbal or don't have any play skills. So it's like our job is to teach these appropriate play skills. And like with that, of course, comes demands. So it's hard for a lot of people to when you say like, Give your kid plenty of attention, help them, you know, play appropriate, like, we're so focused on teaching appropriate play, which, like, those were all good things to do to teach appropriate play, but sometimes it's really hot, like, if you're with an adult and you want to provide lots of attention, it's easy, you look at them, you talk to them, right. you whatever, if, if you're with a higher functioning kid, it's easy to provide them lots of attention because you say, like, what do you want to do? Oh, good job, and they do lots of correct things that you can praise. For a kid with not a lot of skills, it's like, what do you do to provide attention? Right, it's a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so, like one of the one of the things you can do is like, this comes from that helping the non-compliant child book. And so, the first thing you teach is like for parents interacting with kids who don't have any play skills, because it's like, with the kid who knows how to play trains, like I can attend, I can provide attention, and I can say like, oh my your train's going over my train like oh they're gonna push on the track um for a kid who just goes like this like how do you provide attention so redirect it. you do but you don't even like you be the kid okay so, just, so i'm gonna try like the goal for me right now is to provide attention without also providing demands because it's very rare that a kid engages like we don't usually see kids who do things only for attention like Usually there's some kind of escape component to it, and it's like, 
right. both. Like they learn, they learn attention becomes negative attention becomes reinforcing for them because it's a sign that their their parents about to break. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, go you know, go take a shower to get ready to bed and stop playing, and they say like, I don't want to take the shower. But always with that escape comes like. I told you to take a I shower. I told you to take a shower. I'm gonna go over here, and if you don't take a shower within, like they get the escape paired with the attention, so the attention becomes fun, and the attention becomes a sign that like, oh, I'm getting under your skin. You're about to give in. You're about to give up. Like you're gonna get sick of this and move on. So the attention is. I feel like it's not usually the primary thing. There are kids where it is, but there's also that escape, so that escape thing. So you kind of want to. You don't want to ruin the attention you're providing with also demands right. so really you want to just um like a good thing to do is just narrate their behavior mm -hmm. and say like oh you're, oh, you're spinning those yeah. wheels mm -hmm. and then you're if it depends on what your focus is but if pretending this is just a pure pairing session mm -hmm. like a lot of times we just because we've worked say this is the first time you're ever working with this kid we've worked with other kids so many times where we know how to like work and prompt play skills we like jump straight into that but sometimes you want to just sit and show them that like hey i'm not aversive i can sit next to you without ruining your life I got you <laughs> because i jump straight in as yeah. opposed to me being like yeah oh, because no. that is attention right like you know prompting to engage properly is a form of attention but it's like could also be aversive at the same time and might ruin the like attention side of it. Away my yeah. So it would look like here you play and, and all. So if I was like stimming, I'd be like, oh, there's your train. It's flying. Mine's flying too. Woo. Oh, look at it. That's awesome. Oh, here comes my train. It's going to roll. You're like, it's rolling up your arm. It's rolling on my hand. Oh, good looking. And then you wait till you catch something. Because I did see eye contact. So then it's like, I did reinforce it. It's very hands-off. Right. And it's different from, there are kid times when we want to do exactly what you did. And like, roll the train, make it go through the track. Okay, now I'll back off. That's using like reinforcement for behavior. This mm -hmm. is more, we're just like providing attention. So this is more of like a first time kind of hanging out with them. Or what we did with DD. Whenever I took all demands out mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. I right. left. And like the whole goal is to get demands back mm -hmm. just took them all because we wanted to do this mm -hmm. we wanted that physical aggression to not even be because they're part of the right aversive yeah. yeah and it's also good you you get rid of the motivation and then it gives you like a good rapport rapport and now you can be like okay so you can we did identify it you know what i mean if you mm -hmm. take away all the demands and just ham up the attention, then you can be like, okay, so you like attention and you don't like demands. Now we kind of get the behavior and now we know we can, like Small how we can introduce, introduce the demands. It. Yeah. So, yeah, I forgot what I was gonna say. So, it's, and even things like, give me a high five. And we're trying to follow through with all our demands. So it's like, high five is pretending, is a way of providing attention. Mm -hmm. Like, or even if I say like, oh my gosh, there's a train, what color is that train? That's a demand. Mm -hmm. Like every question is a demand, every, like most interaction, because the way we interact with most kids, it's demand heavy, but they're not really demands for a typically developing kid, it's just interaction, but um, like responding verbally is a demand for our kids. Like, he's like, hey, come to me. Yeah, you know. come sit down, let's play trains. Like attention, mm -hmm. yeah. So when you're first, if, you know, when you kind of realize that these demands are aversive and your kid does like attention, you want to start off with like just attention. Kind of engaging the adjustment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because a lot of times for a kid who has autism and like say like I, you know, this is like the equivalent of a dream date, like is lining up <laughs> objects. Like what does it mean when an adult comes towards me? It means they're gonna stop me from doing yeah, my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. So you just, even your presence there is like, demanding. Ah, yeah, demanding. But you do want it, but they do want the attention. And so this is how they get it because so say, oh, they've oh, learned. So I don't like demands, and I like attention. So if I don't apply with the demand, come with demands, like I get, it's awesome. Right. So you kind of want to like remove the fact that you're presenting demands and just do it. And you kind of wait, like you were just ignoring me and doing mm -hmm. this, but you did look mm -hmm. eventually. And then it's like good looking, and then you you know you let them spin more. Mm -hmm. And then you can even you can 
at that point you can try to throw in a demand. You can be like, let's switch trains, right. you know, something like that. Yeah. Cool. So it's, it's also very awkward. Yes. To... Well, it's hard for people to do. It's hard to do. Like, really, because this is what we're going to do all session. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they think like, they think I'm pointless. wasting time. Right. I could be teaching this kid something, but you're really just making an investment in your rapport with the kid. You're building that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you're, de it's the first step in instructional control mm -hmm. because you have to show them that if they behave appropriate, because you might get this, but because I'm actively providing attention, it's not going to turn into like throwing. throwing it. Because sometimes a kid sits like this and nobody wants to attend to that because it's like that's not appropriate, mm -hmm. and then it's like uh, now I'm in extinction and I'm gonna start throwing things. So now you come over right. and then you do all this prompting and then like that's, right. you know, there's, oh, there's that's some attention. Oh, that's how I get my attention. Yeah. Right. yeah. So it's very awkward to do, to provide attention without providing demands. Right. And you'll get, it's like not impossible, but. It is hard. You're going to make mistakes <laughs> initially because you're going to be like, cool, oh my gosh, here it goes, here it comes. Like what if me touching this on him is a demand? You never know. Right. So you start very carefully. Mm. Well, we're going to have fun because we've got a new kid that that's, I mean, that's what we're going to have to do. Really? Uh, oh, JC. Mm-hmm. Was okay. that the assessment? Yeah. 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 Because like looking at him. Right. I mean. Because what happens like if you behave if you behave constantly in inappropriate ways, an adult like adults don't ever respond very well to that. Even so, strangers don't. Yeah. I mean, no. Yeah. So like people coming towards you have to become aversive. So if you can just show them like, hey, I'm gonna like I'm just gonna like. Saying hi is a good thing to do. E even that requires a response. Mm -hmm. But saying like, look at you, buddy. Like you have, you're gonna learn these like, phrases. weird phrases yeah. that are like, oh, look at you. Way to go. Oh, way to go. You're doing it. And the best thing, the thing to make it the least awkward is to kind of like narrate what they're doing. And even to say like, oh, you're that. spinning it. Mine are spinning backwards. Like one comment about yourself, one comment about them. Like, oh, it's going over your head. And kind of like, so like feel it out. Facts. Yeah, just, but not facts. facts. Like observations. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you learn, like if you give them a high five and they like that, then like cool, go with it. But if she would have said high five and that was like, and then you ignored don't it, and I ignored it, and you like okay, I'll and then I would be like no high five because that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like, my hands up for a high five. I know, yeah. <laughs> There's a high five waiting for you if you'd like to accept it. It is here. Yours is right here. I <laughs> need in the middle. <laughs> Fireworks. <laughs> but that might even be, like, if you give a kid a high five and they go, uh, yeah. you might even be like, look, they're playing and they be like, look, oh, here's my hand. I'm going to give it a high five. I'm going to give it a high five. I'm going to give it a high five. And then... Like, and then, you know, maybe you catch it. You never know. You just have to act like a total fool for Definitely a Definitely like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was the one demonstration because that's kind of like the hardest one. I just didn't know what you're asking. Right. right. Well, that's what, like, if, that's why I wanted to do that. I wanted to start out, oh, this is like, I wanted to start out and just say, like, hey, play with me and give me plenty of attention mm -hmm. rather than talk about that. But, like, because of your training, you did it anyways. <laughs> I failed. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> For my purposes. But don't do it. <laughs> but I mean, that's how we, like, those things are, You there are times when you do do those things. Like, new therapists won't be as hard, but old therapists is definitely mm -hmm. harder. Yeah. It's teaching yourself new tricks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we do have play programs where it's like play with this toy for 30 seconds and if you try to throw it away I'm just going to re redirect you back to it and there, so there is like a place for that Like on my screen is different than what this is. This is weird. Yeah, that's crazy. 
Unplug it and plug it back in. Or I think I'm just gonna, if I turn, close this. It's still on. I made a projector. Oh no, that was. If you want me to punch you so you know what it really feels like? And then you want you me to tell you the thing or Tap tap. Okay. Tap tap. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? What? Like, that's your size. <laughs> tap tap. Tap tap. But how do they know? Because it's like how much pain you have. It's how much you pain. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I think. Like, do they tap good. your forehead, too? I don't know. I've never had it done before. You never had them tap your forehead? Uh-uh. About the recording this. Now we're all like... <laughs> Edit. Edit. <laughs> That's that out of there. Yeah, the, the thing that I have an IV in Frida. What's that? Nose Frida? Yeah. Is that? Is she going to have a nose job? <laughs> I am. It's just instead of doing um, <laughs> the, the bulbs that you have like. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's just too. No, it's got a filter in it, like barriers. But you put it up to her nose, oh, you have okay. to put it in, and you'd be like stuck in all the spots. Like, oh. But you never like it doesn't. Well, yeah, yeah. It's so disgusting. I'm like, it's almost like you're so. <laughs> that I could have. Yeah. Things that come from the nose is like my ultimate weakness. I'd rather have poop everywhere. We're gonna cut this out. Yeah. yeah. No, but seriously, I go like. <laughs> 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 you like watch it go. Uh, it you can see it like come out. Oh, of do you like it. taste? I mean, can you taste like the wind? No, it's like, that, no, it's I mean, not not the actual snot. Right. But, you know, I mean, but like the odor, sort of. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Do you, like, you get a whiff of it? Like, no, it's happens? so tiny. You don't inhale it. You don't go. It's like like sucking on a straw. Like, mm-hmm. What an interesting contraption. I hope the one tube that separates never breaks. Well, hopefully, you never have to get a scope. So is the I mean, it's, it's like a neti pot, but different. It looks like a little. It looks like a syringe. Look at this one. Oh, and why it's got a filter and a tube. Why didn't she do the mini turkey baster? That's what I did when I was little. Because with the nose ring, you can do like three seconds. Whereas if you do it with that thing, it's like one, two, three, four, five. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just like takes a lot longer. So this one you just. And she goes. Ah. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah. When they put that scope up my nose, I was like. I've been like holding like this. He's like, you okay? I'm like, handle. I guess. <laughs> I guess. It was like, I feel like it was like all the way up here. It was that the is not worst. Good. Well, it's like in this. your brain. Whichever side it was, I was like, uh, or uh, it was really weird. That's like, it's on. Yeah. That is <laughs> and scene. Yes, I know. Is it up there? Now? Okay. Or is that yeah. This Scoping is, and this noses. Is, this is ready. Okay. Um, so we did attention, like providing free attention. What does providing free tangibles look like? Just, Just giving her a toy to yeah. play with. Yeah. And that's basically the way this room is set up. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you do. Yeah. Um, and this one gets hard because tangible is one of the things where it's like really becomes not feasible to give at all times. But if you wanted to say like, okay, I'm going to make behavior go away. You basically say yes to all of their questions. Um, what so is attachment parenting? But mm-hmm. well, yeah, yeah. Um, what does free access to escape look like? Maybe just, not free access, or just like with an What does decreasing like, their wandering. motivation to escape look like? Decreasing their motivation. Them decreasing their yeah, like a lot of breaks. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you notice a kid can only work for about ten trials, then you let them go at eight, mm-hmm. and then you don't see that behavior anymore. You shouldn't. Or if you um, slowly increase those. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, decreasing motivation to engage in automatic. Just letting them stim, like their stimmers, letting them stim every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. Like, like their, their hand flappers, I should give them a chance to hand flap. Yeah. Or if they stim on like what I'm doing with this frisbee, mm-hmm. let them just stim let them do it. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes kids engage mm-hmm. in behavior. Um, and it looks like escape, but it's kind of almost like activity deprivation. Like they, they have more, they don't want to sit. They just got out of how many ever hours of school and you're bringing them on to sit at the table and like they want to bounce around. So maybe before you start your session, do a little like, we're going to do an obstacle course and, a ta- and the trampoline and we're going to run and we're going to do cartwheel and then we're going to race and we're going to race back and forth. And then you take them to the table and then like they're not trying to run away from you. Mm-hmm. They're trying to sit. Or, um, like with our kiddo with Pika, um, she has the Pika Safe Sensory, so it's like, here, sit and do this for 15 minutes every 
I don't want to say 20 minutes because I know only leaves five, but like, you know, every, thir- every yeah. 45 minutes and then work and hopefully that kind of decreases the need for it. Um, and this is also what, when you get into like that sensory integration kind of stuff. Um, so what the, uh, what the good way to think about that is, is like proactive sensory, like a lot, some kids who like like a physical, like when you see the, the weighted jackets or the, the pressure vests or like those like human socks, whatever mm-hmm. they are, <laughs> a lot of times what you see is like, oh my gosh, this kid is out of control. He's so high, put him in the sock, put him in the vest. He, he needs that sensory input. He's bouncing off the walls. He likes the pressure, but then that's like, this is how I get my best. And so if you provide it, these are about proactive solutions. So if you say like, you know what? This kid does like hugs. He likes that type it's of pressure. pressure. Put yeah. him in the vest, you know, for first. 10 minutes first. Or just provide like frequent hugs. Frequent, like, do you want squeezes? Like what we do with JR, like at any time he can ask for a squeeze and we just kind of just do it periodically anyways. Then he doesn't have to engage some kids engage in this type of behavior to put, get put in holds yep. or to be physically prompted like ki- a lot of kids will um a lot of kids will like wiggle out like our preschool girl like will wiggle out of the seat and fall but it's because she she, she likes you to like sit and hold her mm-hmm. so if you kind of like when she's sitting like if you just kind of squeeze her she doesn't need to fall out of the chair to do it to get it she it's like it's just there um, so these interventions are proactive and make behavior much less likely, which makes them very smart. Of co- like, we're not trying to give our kids a hard time. Like, nobody likes to tell a parent, like, she had a terrible day. Um, we do want, I mean, if the behavior happens, it's fine because that's what we're here for. But if we can prevent it, we want to do that. Um, this is the review. Antecedents occur before the behavior happens. Um, SDs and setting events help you make smart decisions. So maybe if you're in the community and you have a kid who is set off by novel bathrooms and you're alone and they engage in like severe aggression and property destruction because of this, then like maybe ask them, do you want to go to the bathroom here or do you want to go to the bathroom at the center? Because we do want to work on that, but maybe that's not the right time. so you can remove the motivation for maintaining functions um, and remove the need for problem behavior. Um, and keeping an eye on your learner's motivation will maximize learning. So if you see your learner not really responding and not getting things right and looking like they're showing precursor behavior, maybe that's a time to think like, they're not getting a lot of reinforcement. They're not, this is not worth it to them. They're just sitting here because they know if they run away, I'll catch them <laughs> and make me sit back down. You want them to be like, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What more can I learn? What, because what can I get? And then this is an important thing. We haven't really talked about this, but so proactively providing the maintaining consequences is a great way to help your client have a great session with minimal target behavior. It prevents the target behavior from happening so that it can't get worse. Um, but it does not like what you were saying with the, like if you say like, good, spinning those wheels, like, oh, here comes a fly, like, oh, Cooper, 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 like, <laughs> <laughs> strange <laughs> strange proactive attention um, it doesn't teach them the skill to appropriately get those things themselves in response to their own wants and needs so if you're if you have a kid who they engage in a lot of escape behavior so you're like okay I'm gonna do three trials at a time with fun breaks that's kind of extreme but say that's where you are three trials at a time with fun breaks um, and then that works and maybe you can even increase it to like three, four, 10, 20 trials, but you never taught that kid to, to ask for a break. You know what I mean? And so like, you do want to increase that work, but at some point in their lives at school, you know, you can't always be there. At some point they're going to want to, they're going to, something's going to be hard for them. Um, So you want to teach those other skills too. Or like, if I'm just like, hey, providing all this attention, I might see no behavior for attention, but then I didn't teach that kid how to come get my attention when they need it, which is really the more important skill and the more like useful, good skill because not everybody's gonna provide attention all the time. Not everybody's gonna provide breaks all the time. Not everybody's gonna say like, here's a room full of toys, go to town. Um, So antecedent interventions are part of a bigger package that involves teaching replacement skills and extinguishing target behavior. So that's important too, just because we're making 
target behavior less likely doesn't mean we won't ever see it. It's still, you know, gonna have, you're like, I'm gonna give this kid so much attention and you go like, hey buddy, high five. And then they like, ah! <laughs> because, you know, now, inter antecedent intervention is over, proactive is over, the behavior happened, you need to address it, usually with extinction. And that's it for that one.